Versatile. 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 Today, we will visit a part of Canada that has always been very versatile, very flexible. Many changes brought about by new people and new conditions have become part of the lifestyle here. Tour guides, a power station manager, a harbour worker, a native artist and a museum director give more information and insights. from Europe have made Nova Scotia a part of Canada that has gone through many changes. Tour guides at a historic fort explain how versatile these early settlers had to be. Before the coming of the Europeans, uh, the Mi'kmaq had uh, inhabited this land for over 10,000 years. They were very versatile. They had their own way of life, uh, their own religion, and uh, their own uh, culture. The French were the first uh, to uh, inhabit these lands, too, uh, first Europeans, and um, they first settled here at Port Royal in 1605. In 1710, the English uh, came in and to Nova Scotia, and um, they renamed this land New Scotland. What you see here today is a reconstruction of a French settlement that was established back in 1605 by a French nobleman, Pierre de Guasseur de Mont. He had been granted a monopoly on the fur trading rights in the area by the King of France, Henry IV. So what is here now has all been reconstructed by Parks Canada back in 1938-39 and opened in 1940 based on Samuel de Champlain's uh, picture plan, his written descriptions, and also very detailed studies of architecture in Normandy for early 17th century French. Now we're going to go into the blacksmith shop. And the blacksmith was the most highly paid man here at Port Royal. He was getting 150 livres a year, as opposed to the pharmacist Louis Hébert, who was getting 100. He had to be versatile because, uh, as well as being the blacksmith, sometimes he would also, when his work was finished, he would also be able to do some hunting and do some gardening and do other things as the governor saw fit. So we're going to gather into the next room now. If you'd like to follow me, we'll go into the kitchen. And this is where all the meals were prepared, so it's very much a commune style of life here at Port Royal. There were two methods of cooking. You can see the open hearth here with the spit and some meat would be roasted on there. At times they would also use a charcoal and spread it over the stone on the floor and put Dutch ovens in there and cook the meals there as well. Now again here in the kitchen you notice all the copper and iron cooking utensils. These are actual antiques as well that date back to the early 1600s. All the pottery and the pewter has been reproduced. In order some of the game hanging on the wall, quite often they would let the animals hang for several days and let them game, get a bit gamey before serving them and, and roasting them. We're now entering the community room, and this is where all the men would gather for their meals as well as for meetings. The central dining table here would be where the gentlemen would sit, and on the sides there would be more tables, and the working class like myself would eat on the sides. Now this is where the order of good cheer would have been held, a social club started by Champlain to try to improve the morale as well as the diet of the men. So during the winter months they take their turns in organizing a big feast for the rest of the company. So somewhat of a competition among the men to see who was the best chef. And this way it is always in short of good food and fewer men would die of scurvy. And then by having singing and storytelling and music, it gave the men something to look forward to, to pass away the long evenings without their families. We're now entering the artisan's workshop. It was a place of work during the day and a place of gathering at night before going upstairs to their sleeping quarters. Now one interesting feature here is the spring pole lathe that Goethe is working on. 
This is the type of lathe that would have been used here at Port Royal to form legs of chairs or tables or candlesticks. Anything that would be turned here at Port Royal would have been turned in a lathe like this. Now I'd like to follow me. We're going to go into the gentleman's section and see how they would have fared as opposed to the artisans. So please follow me. The room that we're in now was uh, the room of the pharmacist or the apothecary, Louis Hébert. So you notice the apothecary chest and jars here on the far side. And most of the remedies were either laxatives to purge the body or diuretics to flush the system out. Now here, you notice the creature comforts, like, uh, the pre-deer here on the side, the tall back bench, the settle that was placed in front of the fireplace at night to capture some of the heat radiated by the fire. Notice also that the beds have curtains on them that you could close at night to keep it a bit warmer. And this is a fine room, but I'd like to take you now to the best room of all, the home of the governor, the Sieur de Mons. If you'd like to follow me, please. We're now going to enter the final room on the tour, the home of the governor, Pierre de Guasseur de Mont. And this is the finest home of all. You can see the fine oak paneling on the wall. Over the mantelpiece, you see the coat of arms of the first governor, Pierre de Guasseur de Mont, the moon and star, the coat of arm of France, and also the coat of arm of the second governor, the Sieur de Poutrincourt. And as well, the model of the ship, the, this is the type of ship they would have sailed here at Port Royal, about uh, 20 meters in length. Do other things as the governor saw fit. As the governor saw fit means that the governor decided that something had to be done. In order some of the game hanging on the wall. Game is not only something you play, like a card game. In this case, game are wild animals that are used for food. So somewhat of a competition among the men to see who was the best chef. Watch this word chef. A chef in English is someone who cooks, a cook. Now here, you notice the creature comforts. Creature comforts are the things you need to make your life comfortable, to make things nice for you. Now, the habitation lasted only eight years, 1605 to 1613. In 1613, it had been attacked and burned down by an English expedition out of Jamestown, Virginia. So I hope that you have been able to appreciate a bit the history of our site and hope you enjoy your tour while you were here. New ways to produce energy help Canadians have enough electricity. Find out how a tidal power station is part of a versatile energy system. My name is Greg Carlin. I'm superintendent for uh, the Annapolis Valley Hydro System. Uh, we're located presently at Annapolis Royal, Nova Scotia, Canada, and uh, we're in the site of the uh, Annapolis Tidal Generating Station. Uh, the site was built in '84. Um, a little bit of uh, history of the area uh, in the mid '70s with the uh, oil crises and the look for alternative energy sources. Uh, tidal power was one avenue to pursue re renewable energies. Uh, as an experimental site, uh, the Bay of Funday was chosen because of its higher tides than most areas. Uh, in this area here, the tides range approximately 10 meters from high to low, and the tides run at 24 hours and 50 minute day in which there's two high tides and two low tides. So as the tide comes in, we open two sluice gates and fill the head pond to our maximum limit. And in getting there, we have to take things into account, such as our fishways, as well as our uh, inflows from rain, rivers, streams, etc., that are in our watershed. Um, once the head pond has reached its preset level, we close the gates and we sit and wait until the tide begins to go back out 
and at a point when we have about 1.5 meters of head across the unit, that means that the inland side is one and a half meters higher than the seaside. We uh, open our wicket gates that are on the inlet of the turbine. That allows the water to get into the turbine. Um, we bring the turbine to speed, synchronize with the grid. Once we're attached to the grid, we go to 100% and uh, begin generating out into the province. Um, that cycle lasts about five and a half hours, and during that time, the outgoing tide recedes to its full ebb and begins to come back in. Since we are tied to the moon and the tides, in order to be more versatile, we use our conventional hydro units along in the system to uh, top up power demands while we are in a fill situation. What you have behind me here is the control room and some of the uh, gauges and uh, metering equipment that the operators use to determine or troubleshoot or watch, watch the machinery. Uh, the generator itself would power approximately 4,000 homes. So as the tide comes in, we open two sluice gates. Sluice gates are parts of the machinery which are open and closed to control the water flow. To uh, top up power demands. When you've started to fill something and add to it, you top something up, you complete it. Some of the uh, gauges. Look at the word gauge. It has an interesting spelling. It's a measuring instrument. You also have these in your car, for example. That the operators use to determine or troubleshoot. You often hear about troubleshooters also in business. These are people who try to find and correct faults. The goods being imported and exported in Canada make life at a harbour a workplace that must be versatile. Find out how a longshoreman does the many things needed for transport by ship. Hi, I'm Sherman Pace. You're in the port of Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm a longshoreman. I load and unload ships and rail cars to get ready for the ships. We're versatile. To get ready for the ship, we have to take the cargo off the trucks, to, to come in on the trucks and the rail, and we stockpile them. And after you stockpile them, you put each, each ships in each position, in each section, and then you go, and when the ship comes in, you're all ready for the loaded, so you, you load it, and it's in and over the port within 10 hours. And you, you have uh, gypsum that you have to store in the shade and over the rain. You have to have space for everything. And with our containers, we have storage space for the store of the containers when they come in the empties. And the full ones, you, take, you have to take them off the rail and put them back onto the pier and have them ready for when the ship comes for a certain weight on each ship, you have to be stowed the proper way. And you have to have the checkers to check, check everything off. You have your crane operators, you have your brute drivers, your front end loader drivers. And it's all just one big happy family. You gotta work together in order to produce. To become a longshoreman, you have to learn how to drive equipment. 
they got to be interested in the, in the docks and, and, and know what's going on in the, the loading ship and the CN rail and the, the trucks, everything that involves the shipping industry. And once you get all that together, it takes a few years before you become familiar with it all. And then everything, the pattern falls in right and you just have to come in, you drive your front end, you drive your brute, whatever you're that day, whatever you're destinated to drive. And if you ship the crane operator, you gotta go up, then you, you lift the container off the brute and you lift it up and you carry it over and place it on the ship. And then you come back and then you, you, if you, you gotta dump the ship, you gotta bring one off and put it on the brute. The brute takes it from the, from the crane, takes it to the CN rail, and then you have a machine there to load it onto the rail car. For, for the road to the port to, to go wherever the destination is and then the, it reverses coming back in you have to take empty the shunts and stockpile them they have everything ready for for the ship when it comes in so you don't delay the ship 12 hours you can pretty well turn the ship around it, it all depends on how many cranes you put two cranes on it or four cranes and it all depends on, on how many containers it has if, let's say uh, we average 25 to 30, sometimes you're down to 18 an hour, sometimes you get 40 an hour. It, uh, it all depends on, on how the ship is. Sometimes uh, the locks onto them, for the, when you lock the, put the container onto the ship and you lock them, the locks are not working properly, so there's a little delay there. And uh, then you have the lashers got to go up with their poles to unlock them. And we stockpile them. When something is stockpiled, it is collected and kept for future use. In this case, it's the containers in the harbor. I've been in the Union 43 years. I worked at Halterm here for 25 years. Long time. The Native Americans have a long history, but today they must be versatile in Canada's modern society. An artist explains how he lives in both worlds. My name is Alan Sullivan, and I'm a Mi'kmaq artist from True Nova Scotia, and it's an hour, uh, one hour from here. And I live in, on the Millbrook Reservation and that's where I was born and I'm still there. My whole life it revolves around my culture and I like to think that my work will bring the ancient designs, the, the symbols forward and keep them current. They're part of what I am today. I'm not trying to replicate the past or trying to be someone that you know lived a hundred years ago. Uh, uh, the reality is that uh, I, I'm a modern Mi'kmaq in this modern time. But I never forgot, uh, never forget my roots and where I come from. And so it's extremely important that uh, these symbols are preserved and that even ourselves as Mi'kmaq people get to see what our own designs or ancestors did and understand the work, what it entails and, and uh, the purpose of it. From the time I was going to school, uh, to this time, I think uh, life has changed a lot as far as uh, Mi'kmaqs go in, in that uh, we're, we're more visible. Before I went to school, I spoke uh, uh, no English at all. I spoke Mi'kmaq, my language, and but assimilation uh, was forced on us. We, um, we had to start talking English and, and, it, and it was, you know, that you couldn't you couldn't do well in school if in, in Mi'kmaq your language held you back if you didn't speak good English and, and and that's how it was sort of given to us and that's how it went but in that process I think you know we've we've sort of got lost too we've lost our identity and who we are and I think also that was damaging to us and we're trying to regain that and we are searching for our identity and I think that's sort of a lifelong 
uh, process and I think you have to know who you are uh, to find your uh, footing in this, in this world. I think that that's why I was put here as an artist to tell a story uh, of my people and I think that you know it it's, it's good for all of us. I'm sure in the old days there were people that followed that that had a role such as mine or a similar role and uh, and I think that I'm a modern version of, of something that uh, probably was always part of my people. Uh, I think in this modern world uh, Micmacs today have to be a, a versatile people and I think that they have to learn uh, to cope with the modern world and and, and get out there and, and uh, um, learn to be doctors and lawyers and and learn some uh, untraditional things but I think that you know being a traditionalist uh, I think helps you in that that it, it, it makes you understand who you are and where you came from but then you know it's a part of you and but you you know you look forward to the future and uh, uh, making, uh, you know, making your way, making a living in this world. Uh, life has changed a lot as far as uh, Micmacs go. This is a term that shows the relationship between two different things, shows a reference. The fishing industry has gone through many changes in the past two centuries. Listen to the story of how versatile fishermen have worked to develop their livelihood. My name is Ralph Getson. I'm the Curator of Education at the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. We're now up on the second level of the museum. And as you can imagine from our name, we tell the story of the fishing on the east coast of Atlantic Canada. For 500 years they've been fishing on this coast. And the fish that they've been after has been the cod. Cod is the most important fish in the days before refrigeration. Uh, when it's caught and cleaned, it can be salted and dried and you have a product that will last for a long period of time. It was a very important source of protein for the poor of Europe, for the armies of Europe, and when we have settlement in the New World uh, for uh, colonies in the West Indies and South America. codfish known as the beef of the sea. In Nova Scotia, we call it the bread of the sea. And Lunenburg has been involved in the fishery for a long period of time. Uh, the town settled in 1753 by uh, foreign Protestants, uh, people who were farmers, peasants, tradesmen. But when they got to the New World, found that farming was a very poor here, a lot of stones. It's all right if you're farming granite, but uh, not very good soil. So they were versatile enough in that they could turn to the fishery. And they started very early on to the near shore banks and beginning in 1873 to the Grand Banks off of Newfoundland. Fishing in boats like I'm sitting on right now, a dory, fishing with long lines, up to two and a half miles of line uh, with uh, baited hooks at three foot intervals and they were fishing for cod and the town really grew from the period when they began to fish the Grand Banks in the 1870s in the 1880s and 90s with the heyday for the fishery a lot of fortunes coming in through uh, from the, the fishery meant that the town could grow and in 1888 the town incorporated 
and they were involved in that salt fishery uh, right down until the time of the Second World War in schooners, in fishing schooners like the Blue Nose. After the war, they started the modern fishery, fishing with large nets and bringing the fish in and selling it fresh. Instead of packing it in salt, they packed it in ice. And that really was the beginning of the modern fishery. Many changes took place in the 1950s and 60s. New equipment, uh, they went into cooked fish, uh, fish sticks from this, uh, in this building here in the, in the 1950s. This is one of the, uh, the salted codfish here. That's what, uh, that was money to Lunenburgers years ago. Uh, this solar cod uh, spread out to dry on the flakes. Uh, two to three weeks of drying in the sun, looking after it to make sure that it didn't sunburn on days when it was very hot, turning its skin side to the sun so that the flesh wouldn't sunburn. And when you had it, that you could pick it up by its tail you were ready to send it to market. The market for the Lunenburg cod was the West Indies and South America. Take salt fish down and return with a cargo of solar salt from Turks Island. So that was in a very important uh, uh, commodity here in this port uh, down until the 1930s. And then the advent of fresh fishing, of course, changed the way, way we fish and the way we treated the fish as well. In the 1880s and 90s was the heyday for the fishery. The heyday is the time when something has the most excitement and has the most success. So that was in a very important uh, uh, commodity here. Commodities are products which are traded between countries, agricultural and other products. Uh -huh. 